behaviorists thought that all learning was dependent upon uh, what? Yeah, that's true. They're going to throw out the cognition completely. So, would you say that you, in order to learn something, you'd have to experience it directly, according to them? Yeah. Yes, that's largely what they were saying. But we're going to find out pretty quickly that that's not the case. I mean, most of us sort of intrinsically know that anyway. Uh, and they're not wrong that it doesn't exist, but it's not the only uh, factor that, that contributes to learning. So... One of the first guys to uh, reject that idea um, unintentionally was a guy named Albert Bandura. And he is the, well, he's kind of seen as the one that really breaks away from behaviorism and that asserting that's not the only type of learning that takes place. He's the first one that sort of codifies a set of uh, beliefs or views that show, no, actually there is uh, the activity in the brain is actually quite uh, important as far as how we actually learn. And you guys know this, by the way. Uh, I'll start with observational learning, which is what he, he uh, uh, is um, uh, a proponent of and, and developed. But I mean, can I just teach you something by telling you? So you can never learn anything by me just telling you. So all the stuff we've learned here in psych, I've, you've experienced or I've demonstrated to you. No. Have I just told you how some of it worked and you kind of got it, some of it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right. Is that, are you directly experiencing it? No. Is there a consequence for it? I mean, there might be for not studying it, but like me telling you, as so long as you're listening, uh, you can comprehend it and learn it, correct? Mm -hmm. It's possible? Yeah. So that's not dependent on uh, any rewards or punishments. Obviously, uh, keeping that knowledge over time might be with the quizzes and grades, but uh, the fact that I can tell you something and you can take it in and learn it without any consequence is a uh, pretty good um, evidence that it's not just dependent on experience or consequences uh, for a, a stimuli uh, or associations. Okay, Albendura, one of the first ones to uh, contradict this with observational learning. And he noticed that <coughs> when a child, or an adult really, but when a child observed a behavior, especially from an adult, uh, they were likely to copy the behavior. Now, did the kid experience the uh, behavior itself? Not No, not initially, right? Uh, if you watch an adult do something, oh, here, here's an example. If I watch, uh, this is an extreme example, but if I were to watch somebody get pulled over, you know, they get pulled over, and then they like jump out and try to tackle the officer, and then they get arrested and they go to jail. Did I have to experience that myself? No, I probably shouldn't attack an officer. No, can I learn all I can from seeing it happen to somebody else? I can, right, what? Yeah, for the most part, right? I don't need to actually experience being arrested and going to jail and be like, man, I shouldn't have done that. I can see somebody else do that or you can explain it to me uh, and I'll be like, yeah, I'm good. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll know that's not a good idea, I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, so uh, that's kind of what observational learning is, it's that you are seeing it directly. Now, of course, I can tell you, and you can learn that for yourself factually through storytelling and language. That's semantic memory, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, this, though, is more like what you call episodic memory. Like, you see it happen, and you go, ooh, yeah, I don't wanna do that. Or, oh, well, that worked really well, whatever it might be. Like, let's say, what's something that worked well? Um, what's something you could see that would be like a positive? Why can't I think of anything? Think of a positive behavior where like somebody's like, yes, this was a good idea, or they fixed a problem, or, okay, how about this? Uh, <coughs> somebody figured out that they can do what, this is really annoying if you ever live in an apartment, by the way. When I used to live in an apartment uh, in my 20s, it was upstairs, and you had to park the parking lot, so it was a long walk to the car. So you go to the grocery store, you got a bunch of bags of groceries, and the last thing you ever wanted to do was to have to come back and get like one or two bags. Like you wanted to just one trip it best you could. So I could benefit from like say I was a kid or I just didn't think of it. If I see someone, this is what I did, I would take all of the groceries and stack them onto my arm like it was a rack 
and then I would use that and I'd hold the milks in the one hand and then I would get all the other ones I could onto a rack and I'd kind of like carry them like this, all of the bags hanging off of my arms and just walk up. I mean, it like burned like hell, especially towards the end of it, but at least I didn't have to go back for that damn second trip. Uh, so would I be able to see somebody do that and be like, that's a good idea. I'm gonna do that in the future as well. Do I have to experience it myself? No, I can just see it being done and then, and then copy it in the future and learn, like, oh, that's a good idea, and then, and then they, they do it too. There's other things you can do, obviously, but that's just one example. That was surprisingly hard to come up with, but uh, it worked. So that's what's gonna, uh, that's what Albert Bandura is going to uh, um, assert correctly, is that you don't have to experience it directly. Uh, you can see somebody else do it, and you can understand uh, the consequences, uh, or you know, consequences being negative or, or positive. Because the consequence, by the way, can be, it just means, what happens as a result of something. It could be good, it could be bad. We tend to think of them as negative, but uh, it's, it's good or bad, or just neutral. Anyways, uh, so what's the example that uh, Albert uh, Bandura uh, puts out um, as, a, as a primary example and experiment? Modeling. Modeling, yeah. What, what's the example? I, I think I give an example in there uh, about what he observes in children observing. Was it like the parent was like, I think like it was The, the adult did what? No, say it again. I just, I just missed the first thing you said. Um, that, was it a pillow? Uh, it wasn't a it pillow, was, but it was well, something. It was the parent was demonstrating anger towards something else and would, like, I guess, attack it or something. And then the baby would copy that behavior after seeing the parent. Yes, not the baby, the, the, the kid, yeah. yeah. I, think was, I think it was a toddler, but uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't remember the age of the kid, but it wasn't a baby. But yeah, uh, this is referred to, I believe, as the Bobo the Clown experiment. Oh. Yeah, it was a blow-up clown, uh, basically. So it was like this this clown, not real, obviously. Um, but what the what, what happened was the, the toddler would be there, and they would see the angry adult, uh, and the adult would go up and just start punching this clown. Like, taking it, take the adult would take its anger out on the clown, all right? So what they would do is then they would uh, wait to or make this toddler frustrated, and the toddlers that saw the adults get angry and start hitting the clown, You'll never guess what they did. The they went over and started hitting the clown to let their anger out, exactly. And the ones that did not see the, the, the parents do that, take it out of the clown, took it out a different way or just settled themselves, uh, they'd make the kid angry and they wouldn't uh, just instinctively go and start punching the clown. All right, so that is an example of observational learning. Why is it not behaviorism in this case? Why is it observational learning? So I'm assuming here, that uh, I'm talking about the kid, the kid seeing the, the adult do this and then also doing it. Why is that not behaviorism? Why is that uh, actually a cognitive observational learning process? It's like imitation as experience. Well, it's not just imitation. There was, there was context too. Imitation just means an adult hits the uh, clown because they're angry, but then I just go hit the clown just because. Here, here's a good example, by the way. Uh, chimpanzees can't understand what you're doing, but they can mimic it. So here, here's an example. Uh, I could um, teach a chimpanzee to wash dishes by showing him. I can take my dirty dishes and I can wash them off, you know, and then you know, rinse them off and put them on the counter. All right, a chimp can see that, and it can be like, oh yeah, and it can pick the plate up, rub it, and then put it down. All right, but w what's the only time we actually would wash a plate? When it's dirty, right? Do you think the chimpanzee recognizes between, is able to distinguish between dirty plate and a clean plate? No, it can't go, oh, this one's clean, I don't need to wash it. It just sees you doing that and it imitates it. So it's like you can't teach it the context. Like you would only wash the dish if it was dirty. If I gave you a bunch of clean plates, you, unless they're a brand or you want to get like chemicals off or whatever, you wouldn't wash them. You'd just be like, okay, and you put it over here. Chip don't know that though. It just takes, it goes, oh, I saw you do this, so I'm gonna just wash it and put it over here. Also, do you think the chimpanzee actually gets it spotlessly clean? No, no they just like do the rubbing motion and that's about it. It could still be dirty. They don't, they don't actually know. So the reason why I can't just say he imitates him is because they use the right context. It's not like they see the adult get angry, punch the clown, and then the happy kid goes and punches the clown, although they might. Uh, but we're talking specifically about uh, the context where you get the kid frustrated, they take their anger out by hitting the, uh, the clown. All right, so that's the difference between this. So it's context dependent, it's contingent, but we'll get that later. Uh, so again, angry adult hits clown, child observes 
also hits clown when angry. Um, we didn't quite get the explanation though, because I, I kind of I had to elaborate on that. Um, I'll give you the point though. Uh, elaborate on the imitating thing. Why is this different from behaviorism? Why is this process, I've, I've seen an adult do this, and then I do it in the right context, not just imitating the actions, but correctly in the, in the correct context. What's different about that, between that and behaviorism? Is it because they're not actually like exhibiting the behavior, so they're not like learning through that experience of doing the behavior? Yeah, exactly. Did the kid ever experience the uh, uh, getting angry and, and hitting the clown? No. no. He just saw somebody else do it. He might have drawn his own, he or she might have drawn their own conclusions like, oh, that's what I do when I'm angry. Oh, that makes me not angry, whatever. They might have like inferred some sort of reward from it, uh, but they don't know because they didn't experience it themselves, all right? So that's why it's a clear uh, uh, distinguishing factor between the two. This one, uh, kid did not experience. The child did not experience the behavior. Experience uh, the behavior. Uh, but he learned anyway. He just saw the kid, uh, the adult do it, said, oh, when I'm angry, I can hit the clown, or I should hit the clown, so then they go and they do it. All right, because the kid doesn't know if that's right or wrong. They just, they assume you do, because you're an adult, and they go try it, all right? And that's, uh, that's, that's largely how that process works. Now, that helps some people, and then some people it doesn't help them, and the kid might figure that out over time, but at first it's gonna be like, oh, is that what I do when I'm angry? And then they, then they go and do that, and later they'll figure out why or why they shouldn't do that, or if it helps them out or not. But initially, they'll, uh, they, they will imitate the action uh, in, the, in the correct context. I hear birds chirping, can we close the door, please? Thank you. Um, could somebody else in their own words, potentially, I just did in a lot of words, could you tell me the difference between this and behaviors, and besides, I think you already did it right. I think I gave you points for it too. No, I did not. Now I did. So besides Adam, anybody got a shot at this? Why is this observational learning different from behaviorism? Because in both cases, people are learning to do things or not to do things, or respond to them. Behaviorism based on experience, so you have experience with yourself. Well, like this kid, he didn't experience like, the parent getting mad. He just kind of watched it and yep. then he imitated that. Yeah, and then applied it to himself, right? So there's two things going on here. First of all, this process of I see you do something and then I repeat the behavior in the, in the correct context, that's called modeling, all right? So that's where you see it, observe it, and then you do it yourself, all right? So that's what this process is, is the process of modeling. Uh, where you see and then uh, mimic a behavior. <coughs> and if we're talking about actually learning it correctly, like again, the chimpanzee washing dishes, he's not washing dishes, he's just doing the motions. He doesn't understand why you're doing it or uh, what, what, what a good uh, uh, clean dish should look like. They don't understand that. Uh, mimic, a, mimic a behavior uh, correctly, like uh, considering the context. Like kids understand, maybe not super well, but they understand why you're washing dishes. If I were to go up to one of my toddlers and, and teach them how to wash a dish, uh, they would know the difference between a clean dish and a, and a dirty dish. Uh, if I started, if I was like, should I wash this one? They would be able to look at it and almost certainly say no because it's already clean or it wasn't used or whatever. Chip can't do that, uh, but they can apply it. But that's modeling. Um, when do you think modeling might be important? When's a time you should probably watch with particular interest, what you are doing. Yeah. Definitely, but um, I'm not gonna be modeling. Oh, you could be modeling. So you're not entirely wrong, but I mean like, give me a context where I should really watch how I'm behaving because I may be being observed. Well, like, obviously, like if you're around a lot of kids, or like, There we go. Yeah, I'm not talking about like somebody like, you know, checking to see what doing something right. I'm talking about what I do could potentially teach others uh, uh, through observational learning how you're supposed to act. So, and that's a, gr a great point. If I'm a, I mean, you guys are a bit older, you can, you can sort of analyze whether what a teacher's doing is right or wrong a lot better than a six-year-old can. But certainly if I'm teaching younger kids, preschool, kindergarten, early in elementary, or I'm raising kids, you know, infants, toddlers, whatever, uh, it's a generally a good idea to demonstrate 
behavior that I would want them to mimic in the future. All right. So what uh, what type of behavior is that called, by the way? If I uh, if I'm trying to demonstrate a type of behavior that I actually want that person to learn and continue, because it's actually going to benefit their life or lives. Is it pro yeah, pro-social, right? So generally speaking, when you're parenting or your teacher or whatever, uh, particularly with younger kids, again, you guys are much more able to discern what good behavior or bad behavior is, or I should say beneficial behavior or detrimental behavior is. Um, this is what you call pro-social behavior, and this is why it's generally a good idea to not uh, behave in a way around somebody who's impressionable, like a younger child. You don't want to demonstrate behavior that's, that could be negative. So things that could negatively affect your life, get you less friends, make you less acceptable to others, uh, 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 reduce the amount of opportunities you have in life because people don't want to be around you. Those are the sort of things you want to avoid. So pro-social behavior is uh, um, positive, behavior uh, where, uh, that's, that's the pro-social, possible pro positive behavior where um, uh, repeating it or mimicking it, it uh, provides long-term benefits uh, to that individual. What are some examples of pro-social behavior, by the way? Let me give you a specific situation. Let's say I really disagree with somebody. Like, uh, uh, you believe this and I believe this, or I say this happened and you say that happened, and we disagree, and maybe we're angry. Um, how should I disagree with that person if, if uh, someone is watching? You should disagree with them, like, respectfully and calmly. How? Like... Okay, so calm, all right, cool. So you can definitely disagree. So the situation is uh, you disagree with somebody. This is one that can often quickly turn into uh, um, a not so pretty sight. So disagreements. What should I do? Uh, generally, a pro-social behavior would be to uh, remain calm, right? Remain calm. All right. What's another one? I think you said two. Was the other one you said or was it? Respectfully. Respectfully. Uh, yes. What do you mean re respectfully? That's a good one. Like not disregarding their opinion or something. Okay. That's true. Dismissing them without listening. That's true. Uh, all right. Fair enough. I would say. Uh, reciprocal, reciprocal engagement. Reciprocal means like, if you listen to me, then I listen to you. Or if you help me, then I help you. That, that's the reciprocity. Okay, cool. So I should listen to you so that you listen to me, not just like wait for my turn to talk or dismiss what you say. What's another example of being respectful? Because I, I think that's definitely what you want to put up here, be respectful. What would be disrespectful? If you can't think of respectful, what's the opposite of that? Um, raising your voice or becoming like, aggressive. Okay. I would say that's a different part, but we'll get to that. But like, uh, what would be disrespectful? If you and I disagreement, what's something disrespectful I could do to you or you could do to me when we're, when we're having this disagreement? Um, say something rude. Yeah, there you go. Uh, insult them, right? Uh, Non-insulting. By the way, if you have a disagreement with somebody, you're disagreeing about an idea. That doesn't mean that person's rotten. Right? It might mean they're rotten. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're rotten. You might just disagree with this thing, but they're still a good person in general. Okay? So you don't, you don't usually want to uh, be vulgar, call them names, <laughs> insult them, all right? And you're also right, too. You, you don't want to be uh, um, uh, violent or aggressive, like physically or verbally, uh, which kind of goes to respecting. So I would say remain calm, uh, <coughs> non aggressive. You can definitely stand your ground and make your point, uh, but you shouldn't be. Um, Raising your voice is generally not a good idea. Uh, demonstrating uh, body body language or, or being physical that is uh, or physicality that is uh, seen as aggressive, not good ideas, right? That's how you make enemies. Uh, that's how you get in trouble, uh, go to prison, things like that. So that would be pro-social behavior. So if I'm disagreeing with somebody and a young child's watching, absorbing all of it, and seeing how they should behave, these are the things I would want to demonstrate because they're likely to model those because they're try they're trying to soak things in. They don't know. They don't know how that works out, uh, what the outcome will be. And if I demonstrate this and I practice it, and then they practice it, they'll see that this is a much better way to do things because they're much more likely to get the outcome they desire here. Uh, if I follow these rules with a disagreement, I'm much more likely that that person will listen to me and I'll listen to them. And maybe, maybe they know something I don't. And if I do these, I get to learn that. Or you know, I know something they don't, and if they do these, they get to, uh, uh, to uh, hear me. These are the best ways to uh, get an outcome that you want. 
All right. So what would the opposite of pro-social behavior be? Things that I would not want to demonstrate that a kid might observe. Antisocial. Antisocial behavior, exactly. <coughs> Okay, so these are, uh, of course, detrimental, which means uh, negative in that they will actually, it's the opposite of benefit. Benefit is makes my life better. Detrimental means it makes it worse. These are detrimental behavior, uh, which they would mimic uh, that would, would uh, have negative impact, have a negative impact, impact on uh, life in the long term. Uh, what are some, uh, so we use the same uh, example, disagreement. <coughs> what are some things I should not do? Again, this lot of it's the opposite of these things. What are some things that are, would be an antisocial example of um, a disagreement for, uh, as an instance? Interrupting. Interrupting, yeah, that's not a good one. It's a good way to shut somebody off and make them angry and not listen to you at all. Uh, interrupting somebody during a, a disagreement. What's another one? Oh, I forgot to give you credit for that one, by the way. You got one, you got one, you got one. Did you? You got two. What's another uh, thing that I wouldn't want to do? Wait. Oh, I'm going to go there. Sorry. You get a lot of me for one. What? Insult. 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 Yep. Interrupt. Be insulting. You got another one? Like making you start getting violent. Yeah. Uh, being overly aggressive. That can be verbally uh, or um, physically. So you might like... Uh, you know, get in their face, you might push them, that's the physical uh, aggression. Uh, you might raise your voice, uh, get louder, you might you know, start going the path of insulting them. Uh, those would all be examples of aggression. How do these, how are these detriments? How are these uh, gonna harm my chances or, or decrease my chances of a good outcome? If someone sees you acting that way, um, Yeah, exactly. This is how I push people away, not literally, metaphorically. This is how I, uh, uh, people, this encourages people not to be around me, right? So this is a good way to not make friends, to either, maybe not necessarily make enemies, but certainly they're not going to be there to help you out in any way. Uh, this will, even if you disagree, make people much more likely to stick around, see you as somebody who's a, a positive benefit, um, a good person. Uh, and this is how you increase your uh, opportunity in life. So kids that uh, demonstrate model pro-social behavior <laughs> across their lifetime, they're much better off in school, they have better <laughs> relationships, uh, they have better friendships, they open up to more opportunities, they're often much uh, smarter, and they're usually more disciplined too, which we'll get to with self-control later on in this notebook page. Their life's just better across the board. Because even if people disagree with them, they don't see them as these enemies that they don't want to associate with. So when they need help or uh, when they're, uh, there's an opportunity to uh, learn from somebody else, the people that are there are actually around to help them or teach them or whatever. But if you're like this, uh, and there's lots of other uh, antisocial behaviors we could talk about, like being impulsive, interrupting, well, we are interrupting already, but misbehaving, things like that, uh, then no one wants to help you or be around you because you're annoying. Uh, at the least, or they just outright hate you because uh, they detest your behavior and they either don't help you uh, or abandon you or they uh, maybe even act out against you and deliberately make your life worse, right, by seeking revenge or, or whatever, uh, whether it's the, uh, the route of destroying your reputation or maybe even coming after you physically, uh, those are not things you want to have in your life. So the uh, children from households uh, that uh, demonstrate pro-social behavior or model it, uh, what you see is a decrease in opportunity in their lifetime. They're often less happy, have less friends, less connections, are often less educated, and they're much more likely to be delinquent, meaning they're frequently in trouble at school, and they're much more likely to go to prison. Uh, so I don't think any of those are things that we would want to uh, have uh, for anyone we actually care about. Well, just anyone in general, but certainly someone we care about. And again, it's not as easy as saying, if I parent this way, my kid will automatically be this way. We know there are genetic factors in it. Uh, but you do have some degree of impact, uh, you know, somewhere in the 10 to 20 to 30% range, uh, probably less than 30%, but uh, where you can actually demonstrate behavior that they would uh, uh, want to mimic and see that it's much more successful. Uh, but it's more complicated than just show them this, they'll do it, but it helps. There's at least a statistical probability uh, increase that they uh, will be better off if you demonstrate this, if that makes sense. All right. So. 
uh, after the break, we'll pick up with mirror neuron. The only reason why this works, by the way, well, there's several factors uh, to it. But the only reason why this works is we're able to see in others <coughs> if the outcome of the behavior was good or bad. Now, obviously, earlier on for toddlers, they just they assume that's what you're supposed to do. But uh, the example I gave about the uh, prison thing, if, you, if I watch somebody just attack an officer and then um, <coughs> Uh, get arrested and, and, and spend their you know life in prison or 20 years in prison, whatever it might be. Um, why am I able to know that I shouldn't do that? Yes, I can see the repercussions and do I know that prison is not a place I want to be? Yeah, how do you know that? You've seen or heard things, correct? Yeah. And then what are you able to do? You're able to, I think, right? You're able to sort of put yourself in that position in that you would know, yeah, I don't want to be in that position. I don't want to be locked away forever, limited uh, you know, with space and uh, open up to uh, violence and other heinous acts in a prison and not able to see people that I like or to do things I like, all those things. You're able to, the reason why you know it's bad isn't just this, I say, hey, this is bad, don't do it. That wouldn't mean much to you. It means something because you know what it would be like if you were in that position, correct? Are you with me on that? Okay. That's partly what we call empathy. Empathy is the ability to understand somebody else's perspective, feel what they feel, put yourself in their position. All right, sympathy is I feel sorry for you because I know something bad happened. Empathy is I feel sorry for you because I can put myself in your position and I can feel or at least imagine what that would be like. That's kind of the difference between the two. Uh, empathy uh, is characteristic of, of humans and primates and other animals, but uh, what we're talking about here is empathy, of course, like I mentioned, but we actually have things in our brains that allow us to observe others and feel what they feel, put ourselves in their situation and experience what they experience. Um, one of the functions, or one of the mechanisms are a um, uh, part of your brain, in, your, in the circuitry in your brain, your frontal lobes, and those are called mirror neurons. Those enable us to see something, observe something, or even think of something uh, happen to somebody else and then we can actually put ourselves in that position and, and feel the consequences, whether they're good or bad. All right. So, and they actually discovered this on accident too. They uh, had um, this monkey hooked up to an EEG or something, uh, and they wanted their lunch break, and they left the EEG on. And when they came back, they all they were eating ice cream uh, or candy or something like that. Uh, something that the monkey knew was sweet, like a, a dessert. And as they were eating their ice cream and their dessert, they observed in the monkey's brain behavior his reward centers were uh, going off as if the monkey himself was eating the ice cream. So would that be empathy? Is the monkey putting that his himself into the position of that person eating the ice cream? How do I know that? Because why? Yeah, his brain is acting as if he is actually consuming the ice cream. His reward centers are active, uh, again, as if he is the one that is eating. Um, have you ever had this experience? I know I certainly have. If I were to watch something happen on uh, a movie, or like I'm watching a surgery or something, and somebody has something really bad happen, and like they get their legs shot off, or they get stabbed, or they cut them open to do surgery, I know myself, I don't just go, oh, I actually like feel it in that exact spot in my body. Like, my, my leg will feel uneasy uh, when something's happening, they like in a surgery or it gets blown off or whatever. Uh, that's a similar uh, sensation in that I see it happen and I can actually experience it and feel it uh, myself. That's a little extreme, but it gets the point across that we have that unique ability. And part of that is because of our mirror neurons. We can see it and we can feel it ourselves. And that makes us much more likely to uh, mimic things that we believe are positive like the ice cream eating, uh, and avoid things that we feel uh, are negative, like if we put ourselves into that uh, situation or perspective, like the uh, prison thing. Or like, I don't need to know, like I've never touched a fire myself, I don't need to, man. I've seen, I've seen it happen. I've seen uh, people touch hot things uh, and uh, experience burns. I don't need to go there. I've felt hot before, I know what pain feels like. I don't need to actually grab a furnace or, or something that's like, uh, you know, 
red hot and burn myself. I'm like, I'm good, man. I see it happen to somebody else. I can understand it. I don't need to experience it myself. No, that's different, actually. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the reason why, we'll, we'll talk about this more when we talk about, actually, we'll talk about when we talk about emotional learning, which is not necessarily a real thing. But um, what you're talking about is, why do I feel good when I help somebody? And the answer is not because you know it makes them feel good and you're also experiencing that. Uh, it's just some people, that act, that self, gives them a, a, a reward, a dopamine hit, just for helping them, all right? Because they know someone likes them or they appreciate it, that's what gives them the uh, fulfillment and the reward. <coughs> so for example, um, let's say that um, I am myself fully capable, let's just say uh, I'm not, well, we'll take my wife and I, for example. My wife's really empathetic. Like, she can't not help people because she actually, on the, on the reverse, feels guilty or negative if she doesn't help people. Uh, in this case. So when she does help people, huge reward to her brain. She feels great. If she doesn't, she feels bad. There's guilt, shame, whatever. Um, I don't have as extreme of a uh, sensation as she does either way. Like if I help somebody, it doesn't make me feel as good compared to her. It does. It's not like I feel nothing. Like here I helped you when you needed it. I'm just like, man, whatever. Like that doesn't occur. But I know based on how she reacts uh, and, and the, the, the importance she puts on uh, helping people out that she clearly gets a big reward from it. It's not the same reward I get. On the reverse too, uh, the guilt and shame and upsetness she feels for not helping somebody out or putting herself first or something is much more severe than, than I get. So it's not that I can't see or know that helping somebody makes them feel good. It's just I don't get the same degree of reward she does. So she's got, I don't know, more dopamine receptors or that action activates her system whereas the other ones don't. But uh, that's the difference. So it doesn't mean that I'm only empathetic because I feel good because you felt good. I just get rewarded because I help you and I know I helped you and, and you like me, if that makes any sense. That was a really complicated explanation. But it's like saying it's not that some people aren't as helpful because they don't know what it's like to be helped. Like they can't put themselves in that perspective. They just don't enjoy it as much as somebody who is more empathetic does. All right, cool. Uh, so that's mirror neurons. So that's our ability to actually see and experience what others experience, uh, which has a big impact. Because again, you can watch somebody do something that's beneficial or watch somebody do something that's detrimental or bad, and uh, you can actually realize what it would be like to experience that. Be like, yeah, that's a good idea. I like that outcome. I, I want to do that too. Uh, I know I would like that. Or, oh, that's a bad outcome. I know how that would feel. I would not like that. I'm going to avoid that behavior. Uh, this is definitely part of what allows us to do that. We clear our mirror neurons. All right, sweet. So, probably the last topic I'll cover is, um, wait, no. is it the last topic I'm covering? Yeah, let's say, it may or may not be. We'll, 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 we'll try it out here. All right. All right. Contingencies, this always, seems to confuse people. And I understand it's, it's, not, it's not an easy concept to, to get across. Um, this is, I don't wanna say it's entirely specific to humans, but it, it, it's mostly specific to humans. Uh, contingencies or contingent learning, contingency learning? Contingency learning. I forgot to update the notes, by the way, so you'll probably have to change your definition here you have for contingencies when I explain it. Um, I, I've actually heard it called human contingency learning because other animals more or less are not capable of it. Uh, or if they are, it's very few animals like orcas and dolphins or I think magpies, by the way, are super smart. Uh, they just don't live long at all. <coughs> Have you guys seen the video of the uh, killer whale that traps, sets traps for birds to eat? What it'll do is the train will feed a fish and it'll save some of the fish and then it'll go over to these birds and throw the fish up uh, on the shore and the birds come down and get it and it'll just keep eating the birds. So it's like setting traps. Anyway, <clears throat> it's pretty cool. And dolphins too, are, they like trap fish by like uh, stirring a bunch of mud that's like a net and then they go in and just eat the fish because they can't 
they're too afraid to go into the mud. So they just, it's almost like a net for them. They just eat them all up inside of it. Uh, they're pretty smart. But anyways, contingency learning. Contingencies are like factors. Uh, those impact or don't impact um, a certain outcome. So, for example, if I do good on a test, and I did three things before the test. Number one was I ate a bag of uh, Doritos, I studied for the test, and I watched a video on, um, uh, on what on earth would you watch a video of that's not school related? I'm like not even thinking. A video on how to do your makeup a certain way. There we go. All right, and it's a psych quiz. And I go and I do good on the quiz. It's like, yay! Which one of those factors actually impacted the uh, result? So, why didn't the other two? Yeah, they're not related. So we're able to assess like which factors are contingent upon the outcome. So like which ones actually impact it, which ones actually don't. All right, that's kind of unique to humans. And the reason why they found this out, I think it was, I think it was Bandura. No, no, that wasn't Bandura. Who the hell was it? Robert Rascorla, I think. I might be wrong on that, but I don't think I am. Uh, he's the one that did some uh, research on this uh, because he found a phenomenon known as the blocking effect, which showed that most animals cannot <coughs> deduce why something happens. All right, so here's the example they gave. So we know classical conditioning, right? I can train a mouse even to uh, know, associate a light turning on with food. Like if I turn a light on and I feed the mice, uh, pretty soon they'll start salivating just like the dog did, right? That makes sense, correct? That's classical conditioning. We do know that one. So like, uh, here's the example of the mouse. All right, so classical conditioning. So according to classical conditioning, if I showed a certain stimulus, uh, stimulus, and I get a certain response, in this case it's unconditioned, but, um, Light uh, equals food, so then they are going to salivate. We know that, that's classical conditioning. What if though, and, and, and say I, I got acquisition, success, the mice now uh, salivate when I turn the light on because they know food's coming. You with me on that? Okay. If I add a tone plus light, could you turn that down a bit? Thanks. All right. Uh, if you got a tone plus the light, uh, what will happen is the, the mouse will still associate that uh, with food and they'll still salivate. So let's say I do this a bunch, I've got the acquisition, great, and then I do this for a long time as well. So the mouse should know that the tone is associated with the uh, food, right, and salivate, correct? All right, so that's what they expected. So then they took the light out and they did the tone, and they would do it a bunch, and uh, I would get no salivation. Would a human realize that the tone is going to mean food? Yes, you would. But the mouse is not able to. It's like it was blocked. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, because this association existed, uh, the, it blocked the um, formation of this association. That's called the blocking effect. Uh, humans are sort of uniquely able to figure out what causes what, all right? Again, some other uh, mammals uh, and even um, uh, you know, sometimes with birds, I'm sure there's some other ones they've discovered recently I don't know about. They can somewhat figure out uh, contingencies, but we're much more adept at distinguishing which factors actually cause something and which factors don't, right? So uh, we're able to much more clearly distinguish between uh, stimuli or factors than other animals are. There's essentially not a blocking effect for us, for most of us anyway. Most of us would realize, oh, the tone also comes along with the light. Even if there's no light, I'm probably going to get food because I heard the tone. Sure enough, we, we would probably know that, uh, whereas um, animals might not. So this uh, contingency learning is over time, you experience lots of things, obviously, uh, and you eventually figure certain patterns out. Like, oh, when this happens, this happens. And even if something else happens along with it, you know that it doesn't necessarily mean that caused the uh, uh, response. So that probably didn't help you. Let's give an example. another example. Let's say um, I normally sleep well at night, but one night I sleep terribly. 
right? So normally I sleep good, and then one night, oh man, my sleep was awful. I couldn't go to sleep, I woke up a bunch, I don't know what happened. What could I, what could I do? Come on, we gotta be better detectives than this. I slept bad, I guess I just sleep bad, that's it, I'm done forever. What could we do about that one night that we slept bad? Come on, you can do it. Just guess, man. I feel so terrified of being wrong. Like go to bed earlier, like get all the Okay, so you're trying new things, right? But before you even try new, you're totally right, by the way. You can try new things. Before you even try new things, though, should you think about what possibly caused the bad sleep? Yes. Yes, right. So in this case, we're going to look at what are all the things I did, what are all the stimuli that I that I that I got, the things that I might have done, eaten, seen, whatever, right? So let's make a list. Let's just put this up here. Uh, let's say uh, before bed, in the hour before bed, I uh, did all the following. I um, uh, ate a, an apple. I drank a soda or coffee, right? Uh, I also um, read a book or part of a book. I know you're like, I wouldn't do that, nor would I, but we'll just say you did. Uh, I meditated. There we go. And I also uh, uh, was on my phone uh, for 15 minutes. All right. Are these all various stimuli that occurred before the bad sleep? Yes. Okay. So why don't I associate all of them with bad sleep? Because you could be like, oh, well, then I can't do any of these things. Is that what we would do as human beings? No, because no, you, through experience or even learning from other people, well, just knowledge semantically through language, um, what do I know is likely actually uh, um, the contingency here that caused this uh, loss of sleep? Soda. The soda could have. What else could have? The phone could have. That's probably about it. Uh, it is highly unlikely that uh, the apple uh, caused me to be awake. Sugar rushes aren't really aren't actually real, by the way. Just so you know, Mythbusters busted that a long time ago. Um, you can have a, 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 you know, varying insulin levels, but it doesn't like make you super excited and awake. Um, but uh, reading a book actually usually makes it's actually more it's actually better for making you tired. Um, <laughs> same with meditating because it's 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 calming your mind, not overstimulating with external stimuli. These are the things that will do it. Caffeine actually makes you feel more awake. It, it inhibits your ability to uh, process melatonin and feel tired. Uh, and as well as the uh, phone, right? Because you're getting the, uh, the mimicked sunlight, so you trick your brain into thinking you're awake and it, and it keeps you awake, right? I'm able to distinguish that. If this was any other type of animal, if they could even think about how to sleep, they wouldn't be able to, do, to go through and, and pick which one caused it and which one didn't. All right, so that's human contingency learning. So through experience and our acquired knowledge, we can actually think about, oh, what actually, uh, which stimulus actually resulted in the, uh, uh, in whatever response or result there was. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of our ability to look at the factors and determine which one's actually impacted or not. Animals can't do that. Most animals can't do that. Certainly not to this degree uh, can they do that. And then you're right. Then I would go about trying to fix this the next day by not drinking the soda or not drinking, or not, not drinking the phone, not watching the phone or looking at the phone before bed. Uh, I would try to uh, uh, test it out. That's kind of intelligence too, by the way. Intelligence is your ability essentially to, uh, we'll get to intelligence later. Intelligence is essentially your ability to uh, observe and remember patterns and then uh, theorize logically which ones um, would result in a certain outcome or not. So like if you've got a problem, you would think about the patterns and things you know about the world that you've seen. Uh, you would logically try to determine what you could do to try to improve the outcome you want or increase the likelihood of the outcome you want. Right? Like you guys all know basic examples. Don't ask your mom to do something if she's in a bad mood. That's a bad idea. Right? You already know that through experience and your own logical application of your knowledge of what it's like to be in a bad mood and experience you've had with other people or being in a bad mood yourself, uh, you already know that, okay? So, um, I don't have enough time to go into semantic learning or episodic learning or emotion, emotional learning, um, but we'll do that tomorrow. Pack it up, well done.